Well, um, on behalf of the MIT Activities Committee, I want to welcome everybody today to um, the amazing talk on the road to the vote, uh, the women's suffrage uh, trail. And Mary uh, Howland Smoyer is here, um, a Boston, um, Boston Heritage uh, Trail board member who's going to give the talk today um, on such a pivotal year with voting. Um, this will be a fantastic talk. Um, and it's also the celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Um, so Mary will talk about the um, suff suffrage, uh, suffragettes who lived, worked, um, protested, and were arrested in Boston, and some of the public art that's um, uh, for the women who did such tremendous work with um, with getting everything going with with voting for women. So. Um, on that, uh, Mary, I'll let you take us on on the amazing um, history of the centennial of the uh, 19th Amendment and the um, road to the vote. Thank you. Thanks, Diane and all the team for asking me to do this report. I'm very, I'm delighted to be here to speak to you about the campaign for women's suffrage in Boston. My name is Mary Smoyer. As uh, Diane said, I'm a retired Boston public school elementary school teacher and librarian, and I'm a nut about women's history. So I'm going to share my screen now. So, like many of you, perhaps, I did not learn much about women's history in school. I first started to learn about women's history in general and Boston women's history in particular when I joined the board of the Boston Women's Heritage Trail way back in 1989 when it was founded. Our goal is to recover, document, and celebrate women's history. We complement and provide information overlooked by the Freedom Trail, the first and most famous walking trail in our country, as well as the Black Heritage Trail, because those trails do not tell the women's stories. Our trail has always been a part of the Boston Public Schools because the original grant was given to the BPS and most of the original members were Boston Public School teachers and librarians. We have been an all volunteer board, except for the first two years when we had a paid director. Today, we're a board of 20 women who give talks and tours, blaze history trails, work on issues such as having more schools named after women. In Boston, there are 125 schools and only 10 are named after women. We collaborate on public art honoring women and we promote women's history in general. Our guidebook includes seven self-guided walking tours. The North End, Beacon Hill, Back Bay East and West, Downtown, China, South Cove and Chinatown, and the South End. You can find more about us on our website, bwht.org. This is our website. Notice uh, in the middle, it says Walk in the Suffragist Shoes. You can access the Road to the Vote Trail there on our website. You can Buy, buy the guidebook if you want in a hard copy on our, on our website, or you can access the trails here on the website, self-guided trails. You can print them up, or you can just follow along with your phone and walk around Boston up with them. The website also includes two additional trails besides the guidebook, besides the ones in the guidebook. The Ladies Walk, based on the Boston Women's Memorial statue that we'll find out more about later, and the Jamaica Plain Trail. And we also have for your enjoyment, some student design trails. This is a project which we started where students in a school with their teacher would explore their neighborhood and set up a women's history trail right in their neighborhood. We did these six, Charlestown, Dorchester, Lower Roxbury, Roxbury, the South End and West Roxbury. It was a very successful and fun project. 
As you know, this year we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. As part of the celebration, the trail has written and published a brochure, Road to the Vote. This is the brochure. And this is a picture of one side of the brochure. The trail winds through Boston to tell the story of the role Boston women played in the suffrage movement, using the places where the women lived, worked, published, met, spoke, picketed, and were even arrested, all in the cause of women's suffrage, and where they are honored in public art. Today, I'll show you some of the highlights of the trail. If you would like a hard copy of the trail, like this, it's available with a small donation on the website. Details of how to do that are on the bibliography information sheet, which I believe you all received. To get us in the mood for our armchair walking tour, I want to share one of our favorite quotes. Walking trails are based on the belief in the power of actually walking in the footsteps of people in history. Upon visiting the Bronte sisters' home in England, the renowned main author, Sarah Orne Jewett said, nothing you ever read about them can make you know them until you go there. Never mind people who tell you there's nothing to be seen in the place where people live to interest you. You always find something of what made them the souls they were. And at any rate, you see their sky and their earth. So that's what we're going to do today, uh, remotely, instead of with our actual feet. We're going to go on the road through Boston in the suffragist footsteps and see their sky and earth. I'll present the first part of my lecture and then we'll have a short pause for a breakout room and then I'll be back with more slides. Let's set the stage for the passage of the 19th Amendment. It was first introduced in 1887 and it was passed by Congress on June 4th, 1919. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. After passage of Congress, by Congress, amendments must be submitted to the states for ratification. It's a long, complicated process. On June 25th, 1919, Massachusetts was the eighth state to ratify the amendment. On August 19, 1920, with a yes vote from Tennessee, the required 36 states had ratified the agreement. The amendment was certified on August 26, 1920, a day now celebrated as Women's Equality Day. And that last vote from Tennessee was full of drama. And if you want to read more about it, there's a book on the bibliography that tells the whole two-month lead up to that vote and the excitement before and after it. On this slide, you see the 19th Amendment flag with the 36 stars, one each for the 36 needed for ratification. Each time a state ratified, um, the National Women's Party would sew a new star onto, the, onto their uh, flag. There are several versions of what the colors of the American suffrage movement mean. The National Women's Party said, quote, purple, is the color of loyalty, constancy to purpose, unswerving steadfastness to the cause. White, the emblem of purity, symbolized the quality of our purpose. And gold, the color of light and life, is as the torch that guides our purpose, pure and unswerving. So purple for loyalty and constancy, white for purity, and gold for the color of light and life. Here is the front page of the Boston Daily Globe announcing the good news. Woman's suffrage wins as Tennessee ratifies. And you can see by the uh, smaller headline that it is still not quite certain even after that vote. Close vote of 50 to 46 in the House may still be upset upon reconsideration. Anti's also planning to assail legality of action under the Tennessee Constitution. Great demonstration follows unexpected roll call.
How did we get to ratification? How long did it take? It was a very long, hard road, 72 years. You could actually say it started earlier when Abigail Adams penned her famous letter to her husband, John. I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. This is an amazing excerpt from an amazing letter written so long ago in 1776. And remember the ladies is one of the clarion calls of the uh, women's movement. Remember the ladies, we always look back to Abigail Adams. To be clear, Abigail would not have thought of asking for the right to vote. That would have been way too radical. She was looking for other, other rights. Many identify the start of the call for women's suffrage as the 1848 convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Today, this is the site of the National Women's Rights Historical Park. It's an excellent place to visit. I highly recommend it as soon as the virus goes away. Seneca Falls is a lovely, quiet village with a river, a quaint main street, and plenty of Airbnbs. About 300 men and women attended this 1848 convention, making many demands and publishing not the Declaration of Independence, but the Declaration of Sentiments, in which they wrote, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. The most controversial part of the Declaration of Sentiments and the only one that did not pass unanimously was, quote, resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Ask, thinking that women should have the right to vote was so radical that even at this convention, the 300 women and men who attended it could not pass that one. Many declined to sign for that particular um, request. These are the two most famous organizers of the convention, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Some identify the start on the road to the vote as the first National Women's Rights Convention, which took place two years later in 1850, just west of us in Worcester. These famous names attended along with Stanton and Mott. Lucy Stone, Sojourner Truth, Abby Kelly Foster, and Susan B. Anthony. This time, 1,000 men and women attended. Using the 1848 date, we say it took 72 years to travel the road to the vote. By the way, instead of including a photo of Sojourner Truth, I include a photo of her statue, which is in Florence, Mass, just outside Amherst. If you live near there or are driving near there, I recommend you take a little detour to see it. It's a beautiful statue. Now it's time to start on our walk along the road to the vote in Boston and see which Boston women, get to know some Boston women who contributed to this uh, long fight. We start at the Massachusetts State House. On the second floor south, outside Doric Hall, there is a bas relief mural called Hear Us. How did it come to be? In 1996, after recognizing that the State House art collection was sorely lacking in images of women, the Massachusetts legislature authorized a work of art to honor the contributions of women to public life in Massachusetts. The work depicts six women, five of whom were actively involved in the suffrage movement. Florence Luscombe, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan, Sarah Parker Ramon, Josephine Sampier Ruffin, and Lucy Stone. The sixth, Dorothea Dix, was an activist for the mentally ill. 
When we chose these women, we did not have suffrage in mind. So it is interesting that now that we look to celebrate the 100th, the 19th Amendment, we find that five of these women were actively involved. Let's start with Florence Luscombe because she is an MIT woman. In 1910, she was one of the first women graduates from, Emma, from MIT with a degree in architecture. She was a leading Massachusetts suffragist, organizing events, selling journals, and going on the lecture circuit. Luscombe was also a leader in the peace movement, in campaigns for prison reform and factory safety, and eventually an early activist against the Vietnam War. She served as secretary of the Boston Equal Suffrage Association for Good Government, which we'll hear more about later. By the way, there were many, many suffrage organizations and the complicated names can be quite confusing. Don't worry about getting all the names straight. Often when we give tours, a participant will have met Florence Luscombe because she lived in a commune in Cambridge for many years. Maybe someone in the audience today knew her. Mary Kenny O'Sullivan represents the working class women activists. When she went to work as a young girl, as a bookbinder in Missouri and Illinois, she realized that the working conditions needed to improve. So she became a full-time labor organizer. When she moved to Boston, she and her husband both worked and lived for a time at Denison House, a settlement house on Tyler Street in the Chinatown section of Boston. In 1903, she was one of the principal founders of the National Women's Trade Union League. A strong supporter of women's suffrage, she wrote a circular which was distributed by the National American Women's Suffrage Association called, quote, Why Working Women Need the Vote, arguing that if women had the right to vote, they would get equal pay for equal work. Well, she would be disappointed if she came back today because, as you know, even though women have the vote, women still do not get equal pay. It's still an issue today. Sarah Parker Ramon, primarily known as a dynamic abolitionist lecturer, also campaigned for women's suffrage. Born in Salem to a family committed to abolition, Ramon started lecturing at age 16. In 19, in, excuse me, in 1853, she was thrown out of Boston's Howard Athenaeum, literally, thrown down the stairs after refusing to sit in segregated seating and later brought a successful suit against the theater. After the Civil War, Ramon campaigned for the vote on behalf of women and African Americans. Eventually, she moved to Florence, Italy, attended medical school and worked there as a doctor for 20 years. She died there and is buried in Italy. I will tell you more about the other two suffragists in the mural, Lucy Stone and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin in a few minutes, but let me just say that they are the leaders, Josephine Ruffin of the African American Women's Club Movement and a leading suffragist, and Lucy Stone, the leading suffragist in New England and a national name in the suffrage fight. Now we leave the State House and go on the road stopping almost immediately right in front of the main gates where we remember the arrest of the suffragists on February 24, 1919. President Woodrow Wilson had arrived in Boston by ship on February 23rd on his return from the Paris Peace Conference at the end of World War I. The city of Boston planned a huge parade to welcome him. Although President Wilson had come out in favor of the vote for women, People working for woman suffrage thought he was not doing enough to convince members of Congress to make it happen. Here in the slide, you see members of the National Women's Party picketing in front of the viewing stand at the State House where the parade would pass. Mr. President, you said to the United States Senate on September 30th, we shall not only be distrusted, but shall deserve to be distrusted if we do not enfranchise women. You alone can remove this distrust now by securing the one vote needed to pass the suffrage amendment before March 4th. The police arrived, warning the picketing women to leave. When they were fused, 19 women were arrested for loitering, even though hundreds of other people were there to watch the parade and taken to jail. 
During the 72 year suffrage campaign, approximately 500 women were arrested across the country, but only 168 were jailed and only two cities put them in jail, Washington DC and Boston. One of the women arrested was Betty Graham Swing. She worked full-time for the National Women's Party from 1917 to 1920. She was primarily a national organizer, traveling all over the United States to build grassroots support for the suffrage amendment. She first picketed the White House on November 10th, 1917 and experienced the Aquan Workhouse Night of Terror. On November 14, 1917, the prison warden ordered the guards to terrorize the suffragists. Most were beaten, some to unconsciousness. One woman was handcuffed with her arms over her head and left overnight. Betty joined the eight-day hunger strike that followed. The hunger strikers were force-fed raw eggs and milk. This incident became national news and turned the sympathy toward the suffragists. According to newspaper accounts, Betty Graham was the only one to resist the arrest in Boston. In fact, we think that she was the only one arrested both in Boston and in Washington. After the 19th Amendment passed, she continued to advocate for women's rights, including working closely with Alice Paul on the Equal Rights Amendment. Now we walk across the common to the Parkman bandstand where other suffragists staged a watch fire the same day. Suffrage watch fires were initiated by suffragists in Washington DC who burned copies of President Wilson's speeches in front of the White House beginning in January, 1919. Members of the National Women's Party used this technique in Boston on the afternoon of February 24th, burning papers representing Wilson's speeches and giving speeches of their own. The police arrested three of the women for speaking without a permit and took them to jail to join the others who had been arrested at the state house in the morning. We continue on the road of the arrested suffragists to what is today the John Adams Courthouse. In 1919, the Women's Detention Center of the city of Boston was in the basement of the courthouse then called the Pemberton Square Courthouse. This is where the women arrested for picketing and burning watch fires were taken after their arrest. They were held here overnight until they were brought to court the next morning. After their conviction, the women were taken down Cambridge Street to the Charles Street Jail, which was on Charles Street near MGH, the Massachusetts General Hospital. As you may know, the jail is now the Liberty Hotel. Both the jail and the hotel are pictured here. You can see that they're the same building. Of the 19 suffragists arrested on February 24th, one very young woman had her case continued and later dismissed, and one was acquitted. The rest were convicted and given the choice of paying a $5 fine or spending eight days in jail. Four women paid the fine, but the remaining 13 refused and were taken to this jail to serve their sentences. To publicize the suffragists arrests in Washington DC, the National Women's Party organized a prison special, a chartered train tour, nicknamed the Democracy Limited. The train started in February 19 from Washington DC and traveled throughout much of the United States. The 26 suffragists aboard the train had all been imprisoned for picketing. At each stop, they spoke to large crowds about their prison experiences, usually in prison garb. The prison special train stopped in Boston on March 9th to 10th. The suffragists appeared at the six-year-old Wilbur Theater and were joined by the suffragists who had been recently released from the Charles Street Jail. And right in between the words prison and special, you see a picture of a jailhouse door. That is actually a pin that Alice Paul had made for each suffragist who was arrested was awarded a, a jailhouse pin. And those are still made today and you can buy them and wear them in solidarity with the suffragists. You don't have to get arrested to wear them. 
So we walked along Charles Street at the bottom of Beacon Hill and we're stopping at 103 Charles Street, which was the home office and office of Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. This marker here was put up in 1998 by the Heritage Guild, a group dedicated to marking the history of African Americans in Boston. As noted earlier, Ruffin is in the Hear Us mural in the State House. The marker reads, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, African American civil rights leader, editor of the Woman's Era Journal, club woman, convener of the 1895 First Convention of African American Women, member executive board Massachusetts Federation of Women's Clubs, member New England Women's Press Association, charter member Massachusetts Suffrage Association, and co-founder of the League for Community of Women for Community Service, and wife of George. Judge George L. Ruffin. As you can see, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was an important leader in Boston and nationally. As the marker says, she was with Lucy Stone and Julia Ward Howe, a co-founder of the Massachusetts Woman Suffrage Association. The subject of African-American women and suffrage and their relationship with the white women suffragists is important and complicated. And I'm glad to say that we're hearing more and more about that. If you want to learn more, I have included two excellent books in the bibliography on this subject. I especially recommend the new one by Martha Jones called Vanguard. At this stop, I also want to mention Eliza Ann Gardner. Gardner led the way among Black church women as they fought for political power and advocated for equal rights in their churches, focusing on changing church law and building community. I didn't know about her until I read the book by Martha Jones. So I recommend, again, I recommend that book. She worked hard for women's suffrage and she was a founding member of the Women's Era Club with Ruffin. Now we're on the road again, walking through the public garden and down to 241 Beacon Street, where we find the home or one of the homes of Julia Ward Howe. Known worldwide for writing the lyrics to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Julia Ward Howe was an outspoken suffragist, president of both the Massachusetts and New England Women Suffrage Associations and an editor of the Women's Journal, as well as co-leader of the American Women Suffrage Association with Lucy Stone. A long time a founder and longtime president of the New England Women's Club, as well as a pacifist, she issued a Mother's Day proclamation in 1870, proposing a Mother's Day for peace. Howe wrote essays, plays, books, and poetry. She founded a literary magazine. She was an advocate for women's education. And in 1908, she was the first woman elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She lived a long time, as you can see. And by the time she died, she was uh, a nationally known woman. Now we continue along through the Back Bay, along Commonwealth Avenue, and we arrive at our very special piece of public art on Commonwealth Avenue at Fairfield Street, the Boston Women's Memorial, honoring Abigail Adams, Lucy Stone, and Phyllis Wheatley. Abigail Adams, presidential wife and mother, was well known as a critical thinker and prolific correspondent with her husband, John. We heard her famous words, remember the ladies, which are etched on the column she's leaning against to the left. Phyllis Wheatley was the first African-American poet published in book form. She is widely recognized as a mother of African-American literature. And in uh, this project took 10 years from 1993 to 2003 to complete and these are the only statues of women on Commonwealth Avenue, and it was the last space that was left. So we have petitioned the state, I mean the city, and uh, Mayor Menino was the, then the mayor, he was very supportive, and we got some statues of women on Commonwealth Avenue. Very exciting. For today, we're going to focus on Lucy Stone, a national suffrage leader, as well as the leader of the New England suffrage movement. There is so much to say about Stone that it's hard to know where to begin. She was one of the first Massachusetts women to graduate from college when she graduated from Oberlin in 1847. 
and after college, she was an active abolitionist speaker. When she married Henry Blackwell, Stone became the first married woman to officially keep her family name, leading to the coining of the late 19th century term, Lucy Stoner, to mean a woman who stood up for her rights, especially one who uses her family surname after marriage. He called herself Mrs. Lucy Stone. I imagine some of you are Lucy Stoners. If we had more time, we could take a breakout room and see. But unlike Stone, you can vote. She could not register to vote in local elections unless she used her husband's name, which she refused to do. And she did not long, live long enough to vote in national elections. In 1870, Stone and her husband founded the Women's Journal, the weekly newspaper of the American Woman Suffrage Association. The Women's Journal was the most widely distributed and influential suffrage paper in the country. By 1915, it had 27,000 subscribers in 48 states and 39 countries, and it did not miss an issue for nearly five decades. Notice our MIT woman, Florence Luscombe, is pictured here selling the woman's journal. Stone petitioned the Massachusetts legislature annually for woman suffrage. In 1879, she testified, quote, in this very state house, how often have women looked down from the gallery while our lawmakers voted down our rights and heard them say, half an hour is time enough to waste on it, and then turn eagerly to consider such a question as what shall be the size of a barrel of cranberries, taking plenty of time to consider that." End quote. Stone helped organize the first National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, which we mentioned earlier, and founded the American Women's Suffrage Association in, 1969, in 1869. She was called the morning star of the women's rights movement. And in death, she was also a trailblazer. She was the first person cremated in New England. That cremation took place in Forest Hill Cemetery. She is in the number one urn in the crematorium and the chapel there is named in her honor. Lucy Stone is honored with four pieces of public art in Boston. We have seen, we have seen Hear Us in the State House and the Boston Women's Memorial. She is also honored at Faneuil Hall, where she organized the New England Women's Tea Party in 1873 on the 100th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party, calling for the same thing that was called for at the Boston Tea Party no taxation without representation. She withheld her taxes when she lived in New Jersey and her, uh, the sheriffs came and sold off her furniture at auction. She was always an activist. And she is also honored with a bust in the Bates Reading Room of the Boston Public Library, the big reading room on the second floor. And that is the sculpture by a famous American sculptor, Ann Whitney. Stone is often overlooked in the national suffrage story. One reason is that she was very modest and preferred working behind the scenes. Another is that she had a major falling out with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony over whether to support the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Stone supported the amendment. Anthony and Stanton did not. And they wrote the first history of the suffrage movement. And when they did, they left Stone out. They also left out the story of the African-American suffragists. Which brings us, by the way, speaking of Anthony and Stanton, to a new statue which was unveiled in New York City's Central Park in August. Previously, Central Park had no statues of real women, just statues of fictional women. Shakespeare's Juliet, Mother Goose, and Alice in Wonderland. This statue, the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument, depicts Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Sojourner Truth. And the sculptor is Meredith Bergman, who is also the sculptor of the Boston Women's Memorial. If we had more time, we could talk about why these three women were chosen, and if you think they are the right women to be honored.
Leaving the Boston Women's Memorial, we walk over Fairfield Street to Boylston Street. This is where the Massachusetts the headquarters were of the Massachusetts Association opposed to the further extension of suffrage to women. It was located in the Kensington Building at 687 Boylston Street. Yes, there were many men and many women opposed to women getting the right to vote. Massachusetts, which in 1895 had become the first state to have an anti-suffrage association, was one of the largest organizations of anti-suffragists, had one of the largest organizations of anti-suffragists in the country. By 1915, the anti-suffrage group had 37,000 members. Some women were opposed to suffrage because they believed it would diminish the traditional role of women as housemaker, homemakers. The anti-suffragists also argued that many successful reforms had been led by women without needing the vote. That women's work for the good of the public should remain nonpartisan, and that because women were so busy with home and children, they would not have time to vote. Close by, as we walk down Boylston Street, we come to Chauncey Hall at 585 Boylston Street, the home of many pro-suffrage organizations. One of the most important was the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association, which we mentioned before, which you can see in the window here. It was formed by Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, Julia Ward Howe, Mary Rice Livermore, and others in January 28, 1870. The MWSA was active in educational efforts, presenting petitions to the state legislature, organizing lectures, and coordinating efforts with activities in other states. Mary Rice Livermore was a prolific writer and a longtime suffragist and abolition activist. Boston born and educated, Livermore volunteered with the United States Sanitary Commission during the Civil War. A journalist, after the war, she founded The Agitator, a suffragist newspaper in Chicago. When she moved to Boston, The Agitator merged with the Women's Journal, where Livermore was an associate editor. Livermore was a tireless lecturer on behalf of suffrage and temperance, who for many years traveled extensively, sometimes speaking as many as five times a week for five months in a row. Now let's have lunch and join the parade. One of the many suffrage associations at 585 Boylston was BSAG, Boston Equal Suffrage Association for Good Government. They ran a cafe called Sunflower Lunch, right near the present day City Hall. Here is the really old fashioned Boston menu, food my grandparents and even my parents used to serve. You may recognize some of the food corn beef hash, minced lamb on toast, corn fritters, tomato salad, sponge cake, jellied fruit with whipped cream, ginger ale, muffin or graham bread, and look at the prices. <laughs> Even with those prices, they could make a profit. Here is the mission on the other side. The sunflower lunch is the child of our association. It can pay the rent of our headquarters if it can serve enough guests. It averages 160 guests daily. It needs 40 more guests daily. <laughs> Will you be the one by making it a point to lunch with us when you are in town? We give a delicious lunch at a low price in attractive surroundings where you will meet friends. Come soon and often, come and bring your friends. This slide makes me homesick for the good old days when we could go out for lunch. And then there were the parades. In anticipation of the passage of a referendum on the Massachusetts ballot on November 2nd, 1915, that would assure women the right to vote in Massachusetts because there was a campaign nationally for the amendment, but also a state by state campaign uh, suffragists planned a huge parade. They called it their victory parade on October 16th, exactly 105 years ago today. <laughs> the blue bird shown here was used as a symbol for the Massachusetts Women's Suffrage Association. It was created to support the amendment. July 19th, 1915 was declared Suffrage Bluebird Day, and approximately 100,000 tin bluebirds 
were mounted on poles and buildings and other sites around the state. The parade involved over 8,000 male and female marchers of all ages and from all walks of life. Over 200,000 people watched the parade as it wound through the back bay to the state house and back to the south end. Anti-suffragists were also part of the crowd, releasing red balloons and distributing red roses as symbols of their opposition. Unfortunately, and ironically, since it was called a victory parade, the referendum did not pass. It was defeated by the voters, who of course were all male, by a huge margin. Only 35% voted yes. Here for fun is a video showing a float with marchers in the 2009 Rose Bowl Parade. Finally, after all the work, the parades and protests, the arrests, the journals, the leafleting, the soapbox speeches, the bazaars, the campaigns, the lecturing, countless meetings, conventions, demonstrations, petitions, and lobbying, suffrage won. March forward. The last 12 states to ratify the amendment did so over many years. Some later in the 1920s, and some throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. The last five to ratify the amendment were Georgia and Louisiana in 1970, North Carolina in 1971, South Carolina in 1973, and Mississippi, 1984. Although we celebrate the fact that after a long, hard campaign, American women did win the right to vote, we know that many still did not have voting rights in this country. Native Americans were not recognized as citizens until 1924 and were not guaranteed the right to vote until 1962. Asian Americans did not become citizens or win the right to vote until 1952. Realizing that many people of color were being prevented from voting, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, but that act was seriously weakened in 2013. Voting rights are still an important issue today. Don't forget to vote. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and know a little bit, and now we have a few minutes for some questions, if you have any. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we do have our first uh, question in chat. Um, Oh, actually, I, it's not even a question. It's just a compliment and a thank you. Um, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Farzana says that they learned a lot and are looking forward to taking their 15-year-old daughter on the Women's Heritage Trail. Oh, good. Great. Uh, just a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, you can go ahead. If you'd like, you, you're welcome to uh, either raise your hand and unmute yourself, or we can, you can type it right in the chat and we can read it out on your behalf. Um, Did everybody okay. get the bibliography? And um, I have my uh, email at the bottom if somebody has questions later or wants to reach out to me. Yeah, we can definitely. Um, I'm not sure if that was sent out in our uh, reminder email. Yeah, the, uh, the bibliography was sent out, Mary. Yes. Yeah, everybody did receive that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Diane. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. And Shirley is asking if it would be possible to get a copy of the slides. Um, would you be able to share your presentation with us? Um, yes, didn't you record it? Yes, we did. <laughs> it will be available on our YouTube channel. Yeah. 
Great. Great. All right, we'll give it another moment for any additional questions. Um, but thank you again, Mary, for such a great You're welcome educational history of women. Love it. Yes, thank you so much, Mary, for uh, just a fascinating talk today. It was it was amazing to hear about the history. Um, it is amazing how, how hard these women worked for so long. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, there don't seem to be any questions, so I think that that wraps it up for us. Okay. Excellent. This was really fun. Thanks again to Diane and her team. And uh, as it says, well, we were saying earlier, some of us have already voted. I've already voted, but I'm sure everybody here is going to vote. So don't yeah. forget to vote. Think of the women when you vote. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. You're welcome.